Rego said, I'm Dave Coletti. I, I head up the uh, ESPN digital media research and analytics team. Um, I know you had many choices in breakout sessions this afternoon, so I'm very appreciative that you decided to spend some time with me. Um, we're going to make it fun. So, so uh, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is the people and the data. That's what's in your conference uh, program. Um, what that means is this, and I will explain. Um, back in February, I had the opportunity to go out to Palm Springs uh, at the lovely La Quinta Resort, not the chain La Quinta, the awesome La Quinta, and, um, and, and talk at the IAB Leadership Conference. And the theme of that conference was the people versus the data. And for three days, everyone on panels or presentations had to take sides. Um, and you had either had to side with the people, which was basically framed as you believe that marketing success solely is derived from creativity and context and content, or you had to side with the data, which is what you might expect. You believe that marketing su success is solely derived from data and analytics. So we went through three days of that. And uh, they invited uh, me and our head of marketing at ESPN, Carol Cruz, who joined us from Coca-Cola about a year ago to come talk. And, and, and you know, I, the theme was interesting to me. Um, I, I didn't necessarily agree with it, um, but it was three days in Palm Springs when I had three feet of snow in my house in Connecticut. So I would have gone and talked about the mating habits of fruit flies if they had asked me at that point. So we went out and we talked about, it's not really about the people versus the data. It's about the people and the data. And that's what we do at ESPN. So, that's what this means. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to frame it in the context of this, what we call ESPN XP. And for those of you in the room who don't know what this is, which I suspect will be most of you, um, it's not a sports-themed Microsoft operating system. It's actually our cross-platform research initiative, X cross P platform. My wife's a cheerleading coach. She's been helping me out with that. Um, and that's what we've been doing for about a year and a half. Uh, our research and analytics team at ESPN is about 60 people strong. And everyone, across all the media that we measure, whether it's audience research, sales research, consumer insights, um, analytics, all fuels this. So I'm standing on the shoulders of some very talented people at the ESPN research and analytics group. I think it's very important to point that out. Um, we have three goals in how we measure cross-platform audiences and how that relates to people and data. Um, the goal is to move cross-platform research and analytics from special project to standard practice. We've been doing cross-platform research at ESPN for about 10 years, but it's always been about measuring an event or something special. And what we feel like the industry needs to move towards is this kind of day-to-day -day operationalizing of cross-platform research. Second goal is to inform media plans with predictive measures and consumer insights. So this means when we go talk to ad agencies, that they need better tools to plan media, and we want to help them do that. If it benefits ESPN, that's just a wonderful bonus. Um, and we want to link to existing media currencies and ad performance research. This is really important. This means we're not looking to create the ESPN, the metric. We're looking to take all the different metrics that exist in the digital world, in the TV world, in the radio world, in the print world, and find ways to link them all together, both in terms of understanding audiences and in terms of understanding marketing effectiveness. And we do that by focusing on these three key elements. We look at users and usage by platform, which means that we understand how people are behaving online, online video, mobile, apps, television, digital television, et cetera. We look at how all those things relate, cross-media audiences. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we look at the ad performance of people who are exposed to all these different media and what it means for marketers. How do you do it? Well, we like to call it our research surround strategy. I also like to call this the logo parade, which means we go and we do a lot of different work with a lot of different vendors to answer a lot of different questions. And we employ a lot of different methodologies. So we do surveys. We use the various platform measures, observation, the scientific method, simulation and modeling, all of which we engage with 15 to 20 different vendors for ESP and XP, help us understand each of the questions that we're trying to answer. What I'm going to take you through in the next half hour is work that we did around football. The, the first ESPN XP initiative that we really you know, dived into was last summer's uh, FIFA World Cup, for those of you that remember Landon Donovan's goal um, and how the country for 15 minutes really cared about soccer. Um, that was a really cool event. It, not normal on the sports calendar, so we, we had to do this, again, about standard practice with something that's a little more uh, relevant to the American consumer, so we moved from football to football. Um, 
And here's all the different kind of measurement challenges that we had. And we always think it's really important if you're going to measure things, you're going to analyze things, it's good to actually understand what you're trying to accomplish. So this was really important to understand that it's an annual season, there's six months of games, multiple games across multiple media entities, across multi-platforms, and across cross-platform sponsors. Um, but here's, that's kind of the quantitative, and we'll get into that. There's also the qualitative. We wanted to understand football fans, as we say, beyond the face paint. So what drives them? What's their passion? Why do they follow a sport? And why do they behave in the way that they do because of that fandom? We wanted to understand the value of the football environment. What does it mean for a marketer to be involved with football? And how do you analyze that? And then finally, we wanted to understand the drivers of ad effectiveness. What levers get pulled so that a marketer can move the needle on various objectives. So these were kind of the critical things that we were concerned about. Here's where I'll stop and make the first caveat in this presentation. I'm going to guess that most people in this room don't work for a sports media company that covers football. I get that. So I'm going to talk about ESPN and football. And you know, for some people, that's really cool. For some people, you're about to say, what? What's going on? So um, here's the way we like to frame a lot of our XP findings is that Think of the broad context of this. One of the real drivers of, of the work that we do is doing research about research. We're learning that the findings, the way you get to the findings are just as important as the findings themselves. So I'll try to make little notes as we go along about, yes, this may be about football, but there's some universal themes that maybe will help you as you go about your, your daily work. So here's what we learned and confirmed. And there's six things. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on each. Um, from last football season and how that plays into this whole concept of utilizing people and, and data to drive marketing and content effectiveness. The first thing is fitting life into football. So this is kind of the people portion of what we're looking at. Football, this is one of my favorite animated charts, so please give it your undivided attention. I didn't build it, by the way. That's why I can do that. Watch this. It's just so amazingly awesome. This is the, this is the, the, the calendar. And this is football, college and NFL football. The months along the bottom, all the various touch points along the top. People think that football season is now, right? It's October, it's September, it's November, it's when the games are being played. But for a fan, especially an avid fan, it's all year round. It's the draft. It's college football signing day, when everyone really cares about what 17-year-olds are doing with their life. Um, it's about the NFL mini camps. It's this past year. It happened to be about the NFL lockout. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen again for another 10 years. So, um, but this is what we're trying to understand, is behavior throughout the year and how that behavior changes. So, when we say fitting life into football, we did a, a study with a company called Latitude. And what we did with them is that we did kind of a pre and a post. So Latitude built a panel for us, a bunch of football fans. And they surveyed their behavior outside the game season of football. Where do you go? What do you do? What kind of behaviors? Not just media behaviors, but just all behaviors. And then we asked them again during football season. And we looked for the change. Well, here's some interesting things that we found that change. And this helps fuel our conversation with marketers and about how we build our own content. So one of the things we found was that traditional nights out take a back seat. People go out less on, say, Friday nights during, during football season than they do in May, June, and July because they're gearing up for football. They're going out Saturday during the day or Sunday afternoon. Important if you're a restaurant and understanding potential traffic patterns through there. We learned that grocery store purchases change. Among men who are football fans, during football season, there's a huge spike in the purchase of snack foods on Thursdays and Fridays because they're prepping for the weekend. We learned that there's no time for clothes shopping. Also among men football fans, um, they don't shop for clothes at all between September and January. So whatever's in the closet in August pretty much is what's going to get worn until January. Um, also an important thing to understand if you're a retailer. Um, and finally, there we go. Monday night football means Monday night fast food. Once again, a huge spike during football season of pizza delivery, takeout, et cetera, on Mondays as people prepare for their, as guys will say, their me time at 8 o'clock on Monday night to watch football versus other times of the year. We learned about a tale of two footballs. So I'll, I'll put this in the broader context again. This is about how having one seemingly similar content type can provide radical different behaviors and attachments to that content type. If you think about it, the NFL and college football, it's the same sport. Still 100 yards, still 10 yards for a first down, still four quarters, most points win, that kind of stuff. But yet the way that people engage with the content is radically different. So 
I'm going to see if this works. I have a quick little video. We actually, in the course of doing this research, ended up making a documentary about college football fans. Um, this is the trailer for that. Um, so if ever it comes out theatrically, you'll get a sneak preview here. Um, this is how college football fans... Woo. Wait a second. We don't have an audio jack, so I'm going to do this with a microphone. There may be hellacious feedback, and I apologize. College football, it's a way of life. It's 365 days a year from the time that you're born. You're, you're chosen. This is the first picture of me ever right after I was born at Stanford Hospital wearing the Stanford beanie my parents put on my head. It just really represents how Stanford's been a part of my life ever since the beginning. Go to Birmingham. Go by preschool nursery. And you'll see the little kids dressed in either crimson and white, orange and blue. And they're already being molded at a very early age to pick their school. There's nothing better than gay day in Iowa. But there's so much love. I want to embrace anyone I see that's wearing black and gold. I was like, let's hug. Good people. Go Hawks. This is a normal game day outfit for me. I'm going to always wear something crimson, something white. People dress up because they respect it. We've been tailgating here for over 50 years. We dedicate the entire Saturday to the football game and the tailgate. It just doesn't get any better than this. Everybody was once an 18-year-old kid. And everybody sort of wants to be still that 18-year-old kid that gets to go out there on that field and have 100,000 people yelling for it. So that's what we're programming for. That's what we're selling. Um, but, but college and, and NFL are, are radically different when it comes to, to how people follow them. For, for the NFL, it's very much about what's on the field. And as you saw, for college football, it's very much about what's off the field. Um, for the NFL, it's about a connection to a team. Whereas for college, it's about a connection to a school. It's in, in many ways, it's a connection to the community. Um, the NFL is followed nationally, and, and college football is largely followed regionally, except to the very end when we have the, the Bowl Championship Series, which is your Sugar Bowl, Orange Bowl, Rose Bowl, when you get more of a, a national focus on all the games. Um, football is, has limited games, and the NFL has, has limited games and limited windows, whereas college football, there's 120 uh, major division college football teams, so there's dozens and dozens and dozens of games across many, many windows. Um, and what that leads to is the, the, the need to, to use multi-platform, so digital, you know, online and mobile, television, et cetera, um, changes between the sports. You know, for, for NFL, it's about preparing for the game because you have those limited windows, whereas for college, it's very much about getting to the game with multi-platform exposure. So now we'll talk some data, which is always the fun part. Um, so here's what multi-platform means. If you, if you look at this, we work with a, a partner of ours on a lot of our cross-platform work uh, named Knowledge Networks. Um, and they, they do daily reach figures. And, and here, you know, the chart is, is, is relatively simple. The bottom is TV, the number of people per day that are tuning into TV for NFL content or college football content on ESPN. Um, the middle is those who do multi-platform, TV and something else, online, mobile, radio. Um, and the top is something other than TV. And, and here's the interesting difference. For, for NFL, there's a huge portion of mul daily multi-platform consumption for football, while that is there, there's also a much more likely uh, likelihood to consume 
non-television. And that kind of gets back to how you follow the sport. Um, NFL is national, and you can largely get most of the news that you need, at least at a top line level, from a sports center. If you're like me, and you, you follow Syracuse football, which is in the midst of a decade of complete despair, um, we don't get a lot of national attention anymore, uh, ever since Donovan McNabb left. So I might have to go online or on my mobile device a lot more to get news uh, about my beloved Orange Men. So again, understanding the people, understanding the drivers and how people follow something lends a lot of color and insight into the data that we end up seeing. You know, we, we all talk a lot at ESPN about the difference between users and usage and really focusing on the usage. And here's why. If you look at the NFL, 38% of NFL daily users are multi-platform. That's the average of the last chart. But they account for almost 60% of all the usage, so all the time spent. So when we have conversations with our programmers, you know, with our editorial team, those are the people we really need to focus on because they're the ones who are consuming the most content and they're the ones we really need to please so they keep consuming more and more. One of the things that gets talked about a lot in media, and it has been for a decade, is cannibalization. And, and something that we've found, particularly when you look at it at a content level like this, is that it's not about cannibalizing. It's not about media being zero sum. It's about incremental reach. So in the case of, say, college football, if you're a college football media consumer who's using one platform a day, this is an average of, of, of day uh, content, you're spending about an hour, 20 minutes with that. If you use two platforms, it's more than two hours. If you use three platforms, it's almost four hours, all the way up to four and a half hours if you're using four plus platforms a day to consume college football. So for us, it's not about online taking from television or mobile taking from online or radio taking from print or whatever it might be. It's about all these different combinations of media and how it grows the overall pie. And in particular, we said on the digital side. So here we're using our, our ometry data, although we're looking at it in a, in a way that's somewhat different. Um, we're looking at the total number of minutes that people spend with NFL and college football. So billions and billions of, of minutes last season for, for usage. Um, and when you stack it up, you see some interesting differences. You know, the base of both is our good old ESPN.com homepage, which just does a ton of traffic. But if you look at the top of college football, you'll see things like Score Center, which is our iPhone app uh, and Android app. Um, our mobile website and something called ESPN3.com, which if you're not familiar, it's where we stream live games. Those are all platforms that going back four years ago didn't exist or in any real way. And now they're accounting for 25, 30% of our permanent usage. Um, on, the, on the NFL side, you see that at top. You also see a big green middle for fantasy. A huge driver of usage and of our website is fantasy football usage. I'm going to get into that right here in a section called the reality of fantasy. So this is point number three. This is where I'll also stop and say, thinking broadly, understand that many of you don't have sites that have fantasy football on them, but think about this as the core, the epitome of your core user and how reaching them and programming for them can affect other parts of your site. Um, so for those of you that play fantasy football, you'll get this. There's about 20 million Americans that play fantasy football every year. For those of you who don't, here's some shedding some light on what we're talking about. Yeah, people are already starting to read. So we have people, we do, we do surveys, of course, fan panels. Here's you know, some verbatims about how dedicated to fantasy they are, one of my favorites. Of, I checked on scores during the ceremony as the best man at my buddy's wedding. Drove 250 miles for a draft party. This is my favorite. Hid in the spare room during my nephew's first birthday party to draft in my keeper league. And of course, here's the media velociraptor, as I like to say. He has three televisions, a sling box on the, on the computer, and staring at my iPhone to watch my stats go up. So serving these people is critically important for understanding how our website works, how our television audiences work, et cetera. And here's what happens with fantasy. It's, it's, it's the bullet, it's the middle, it's the bullseye. It's also an influencer. So you have your football fans, you have your avid fans, and then you have crazy fantasy football fans. They're using multimedia, they're using social media, and they're actually engaging in a lot of word of mouth activity with brand advertisers. So we'll talk about that. But what fantasy does is it, say it creates a ripple effect. So that usage cascades across all of our other media. 